Hello, my name is Elijah Wells, straight out of recording the best films of the year, now best films of the 2010s. So, let's get on with it. For honourable mentions for best films of the decade, the honourable mentions are Zero Dark Thirty, Gravity, Inside Out, La La Land, Get Out, Nightcrawler, Cloud Atlas. At number 10, I'm giving this a tie, because it's the two films is Birdman and Moonlight. For Birdman, it's basically about a washed up actor who confronts his alter ego to make it big again with theatre business in New York City. And accompanied with some, well, probably one of the best cinematography of the decade, the best acting of the decade, and the, the probably one of the best scripts of the decade. And uh, Emma Performance and Michael Keaton and Edward Norton were just knocking out the park. And for this time for Moonlight has again some beautiful score work, some some great color coding, and the movie is like separated in three parts. Like is the main character when he was a kid, main character when he was a teenager, the main character again when he was an adult. Like it goes through these three different storylines, like uh, like finding uh, like finding a, a guardian being a drug dealer, coming in terms to his sexuality. Then he becomes an adult and comes to terms with his sexuality and have some great performances, some brilliant screenplay and some gorgeous cinematography as well. Like this movie, like I said, although it's undoubtedly on the law of, uh, of number ones of top films of the decade, I'm kind of keeping it at number ten because I haven't like fully thought the film through, even though I've watched it once. I probably need to like rewatch it again just to like fully grasp why people absolutely loved it, even though I absolutely loved it. I think it's a, a like I said, a gorgeously filmed movie that is worthy for everyone's notice. After 35 years, it had returned. At number 9 is Blade Runner 2049. I mean, I watched it in cinemas and I was in awe of just how gorgeous the movie just looked. Like, there's this one entire sequence when Ryan Gosling is in the desert and everything's just all orange colour-coded. And not not just it boosted some pretty impressive performances, but the cinematography, the score work, and the visual effects and the sets pretty much gave the movie the strongest merits there is. Like Harrison Ford uh, comes back to regain his to, to come back to his role after again for 35 years. Jared Leto plays such an intimidating character, and Ryan Gosling. Uh, play, plays one of his more down-to-earth roles there is. Uh, you don't have to, even though I rewatched it when I was uh, with my sister, she's, she kind of got it, uh, even though she'd uh, watched the original film like uh, a couple hours beforehand. She said, huh, this movie is like uh, better, even as a standalone movie, I feel like it uh, introduced the new fans without explaining a little too much about the original, if you know what I mean. I think this movie is somewhat one of the more universal continuations of of an 80s uh, pop culture uh, thing. For number 8, I don't usually review documentaries, because... Documentaries? But for number 8, I probably saw the most soulful, the, the most uh, gorgeous, the most brilliantly executed documentaries I've saw in a while. That is 2011 Senna. It's about a Brazilian Formula One uh, driver, Avon Senna, from winning three world uh, title championships to his unfortunate demise in the San Marino Grand Prix in 1994. This, uh, this movie, for a person like me who's never really gone to like, motor racing, but is somewhat really intrigued just on his uh, life uh, as a whole. It it had uh, Avon Senna, well, through archived documentaries and previously unseen footage, uh, just trying to uh, race his way through God to through God glory while having like the heads, his heads, his coach, somewhat breathed down his neck on do's and do nots to 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 the point he's got like uh, suspensions for months on end for. Driving like I think it was like a, at the wrong at the shortcuts, and he somewhat uh, look he looks down on his frustration and it 
looks at his worries and looks at his achievements. I think this movie is somewhat as a br it's a brilliant beginner's guide to one of the greatest uh, motor athletes ever to exist out there. He's someone that's one of the most coolest people, even for a person like me who had, had no idea who he was before watching it. But that movie is just amazing. For number seven, this movie is going to eat the Joker up for breakfast uh, when it comes to uh, crime time thriller movies. Because this movie is Ryan Gosling's Drive. The 2010s was a brilliant decade to be, a Ryan, to be Ryan Gosling. The movie has some incredible, has incredible distinctive style to it. it has Nicholas Winding Raffin in a director's chair when he did Neon Demon and Bronson and Only God Forgives. The of course, the jacket which he wears with Golden Scorpion is just nothing more than iconic. And as some has probably the best soundtrack, if so, of the decade. Well, truth be told, I actually p picked up an album of the songs that are in the movie because it consists of like a lot of sync heavy music. If you want to check it out, just look for it, look for a CD like this, or go to Spotify or iTunes or Apple Music. It has some great performances from Albert Brooks and Ryan Gosling and Ron Perlman. I mean, I could go on why I like this movie. Like, it had a really sharp script without lending way too much into cliches and some strong direction. Although the movie's violence is definitely not for everyone, particularly when Bernie, played by Albert Brooks, gets really berserk at the end. This movie is it, just so cool. Like, the movie's imagery and the driver portrayed by Ryan Gosling, it's just 2010's cool. I think it somewhat perfectly fits, fits into the 2010's zeitgeist. Like, like, which was the coolest thing of the, the coolest movie of the decade? Drive. All day, every day. For number six, it's the Ethan North Arrival. After he made a big with Sicario, he outdid himself with the beautiful, uh, somewhat exquisite movie that is Arrival. Amy Adams plays this language expert uh, to communicate uh, to these aliens who communicate through these uh, these uh, really uh, beautiful circular artworks that uh, may look like coffee splatters at first, but they're somewhat different and ha they communicate different meanings because uh, pronouncing linguistics is just hard enough as it is. The movie uh, had, of course, uh, provides some beautiful backing music and some incredible cinematography and the, probably one of the best performances by Amy Adam and Jamie Renner there is at the moment. And Denis Villeneuve's direction is certainly on point with this one and so is the writing. This movie and of course the set designs including these massive alien ships and how it really portrayed itself so so realistically when in the same year Trump was elected as president even though the world was bracing for Hillary and when Independence Day resurgence disappointed the hell out of everyone this was somewhat both a comfort piece uh, for when Trump gets becomes a president and also a compensation uh, piece of the pretty forgettably bland movie that is uh, Independence Day Resurgence because that because Arrival would eat that movie up for breakfast, lunch, dinner and a midnight snack. At number five it's going to go down to La Landa Nanda with Mad Max Fury Road. What a lovely day, oh what a lovely day it is for George Miller. Like that movie when I saw it in cinemas completely annihilated every atom of my brain and just blew me away like that thunderstorm that ornate that like that massive sandstorm where this entire car gets sucked into that tornado like I like whoa like this is just so visually gorgeous that thing this movie looks like a massive renaissance-esque painting like when they're about to enter into this massive sandy world of doom. The violence is certainly on point with the prison installments. Uh, like it not just ones up its uh, creativeness, it ones up the goriness which I really like. 
And of course, it was around the time where there was like Robocop, Good Day to Die Hard, Expendables 3, where it's either, a, where everything's just so diet, diety, watered down, which is PG-13. The violence in this movie is off the wall, and gore-wise, we'll just say, someone's jaw gets torn open. The performance of Charlize Theron is incredibly on point with this one. Tom Hardy's exquisite in this movie. Nicholas Holt is a great supporting character. The antagonist being Immortal, Immortal Joe is certainly one of the best villains of the 2010s or probably of all time. The costuming work is great. The, the cars and the set is something to behold. The cinematography is brilliant and the visual effects even though it's like done mainly with stunt doubles and practical effects, it's still better than some of the effects that I've saw this decade alone. It's probably the most visually mind-blowing movies I had ever seen, This not just of this decade, but in my entire life. Thank you, Dad, for introducing uh, these movies to me, because I still have Thunderdome to watch. But, holy boy, I can't wait for Mad Max 5 if he gets around to doing it. For number four, this is a movie that not everyone would have heard of, but this is a movie directed by none other than Isheya Takahata, and it's the tale of Princess Kaguya. Unlike Miyazaki, Isheya Takahata is more of a patient uh, uh, filmmaker, where the movies can last up to like two hours and 20 minutes, like this one, and uh, more of an emotional uh, endurance test. Grateful Fireflies isn't enough for you. This movie is one hell of an emotional roller coaster, which boasts some of the most gorgeous animations I have ever seen. It was around the, the time uh, where CGI animation was the only thing that is in animation with no real variety, and hand drawn and traditional animation was somewhat of a thing of the past. Well, this was before when anime really uh, uh, came it, uh, came into the scene and Into the Spider-Verse came, but this movie somewhat started, or before, Into the Spider-Verse. This movie has the, probably some pretty relatable uh, characters, particularly the main character, Princess Kaguya, as she goes through a, this major cycles of depression and anxiety and has probably one of the most beautiful scores in the movie. I think this this movie is better than probably like most animated movies out there. Heck, even as uh, like, I think it's better than a whole year's worth. No, not even that, better than two, like three or four years worth of animation. It is so gorgeous. It's probably not just one, the Best achievement Studio Ghibli's has ever done. It's also one of the best films it's here Takahata has made, who directed Grave of the Fireflies, which is one of my all time favorite movies. I've seen movies where they had no creative uh, uh, goal in mind. Uh, this one, where it uh, looks more like uh, Japanese uh, sketches from, uh, from the uh, Japanese era times, like back in thousands and hundreds of years ago and have some of the, the best scores of all time. The ending was so god, so beautiful. I'm using gorgeous way too many times, but I'm not going to spoil the ending for you. It's probably the most beautiful thing you'll hear and see in your lifetime. Like, this movie only comes once in like 20 years or something. I could go on and on about this movie. I couldn't even make a 20 minute review out of this. Like, this movie is just amazing. We're sticking back to Asia again for number three, It's the Farewell. Definitely one of the newer entries in this film, but I found it just, this movie was so better than what I anticipated, even though I anticipated something bitter and sweet at the same time because my grandfather uh, was on a heart condition, and my granduncle, who was close to the family, passed away because he had cancer in the lungs and heart. This story follows Billy, played by Aquafina, along with her parents had to lie to their grandmother that she doesn't have cancer, even though she does, and by doing so, they uh, perform a wedding ceremony with their uh, distant cousins. 
like the it, this movie, like Tale of Princess Gugurya, is an emotional roller coaster as she reminisces about the time where when what was the difference between America and China, what China expects from America, what what America expects from China. It's it's some of the national uh, differences in that movie as a whole. And Aquafina, like I said in my best films of the year, deserved that golden glow, but how the hell did that movie not uh, get enough nominations in the BAFTA, even though it got best film non-English language, and no nominations at the Oscars, like that's just why. Of course the movie has some incredible performances, a great script, and some brilliant direction, like I said. This movie is not just really a farewell to uh, Lulu Lang, but also probably a beginning of somewhat of what could be the 2010s, 2020s biggest directors. Like, I am hoping for more films from her. And also, Aquafina, she really outdid herself, even though she's like in her early 30s now. Like, man, she really knocked that one out of the park. For number two, it, this time is The King's Beach. Way before Tom Hooper made the unfortunate meme fest at his cats, he came out really strong after directing many TV movies with The King's Speech. Colin Farrell does probably one of the, the best performances of the decade and has some incredible sets I, I deeply admire, some great costume work. And has Helen and is supported by a really great supporting cast being Helen Barr Carter and Jeffrey Rush. Of course, the script is great, the direction uh, at the time of Tom Hooper was so promising that he was awarded the Best Director's Oscar. He went on to direct, of course, Le Mis, The Danish Girl, and His Dark Materials, and the one we shall never talk about until I review it eventually. It's Cats, by the way. It basically shows a king in, the, in his own coffler as he suffers for his stamina, his, his brother abdicated just only months into his role and the, the, the whole country of Britain is in the brink of World War II. And he, he has a major confidence boost by having a huge nationwide uh, radio saying that we're going to war and yeah, 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 I haven't seen this movie for a while but I love this movie. Of course, if you have not seen this, The King's Speech or you're forced into watch it, you'll be rewarded. At the favourite film of the decade is the very moment I have a major confidence boost in Christopher Nolan and that is Inception. I mean... <sighs> I have never seen anything like this and I haven't had for the previous 10 years. Like, this movie is at a special level of uh, insane originality like the closest thing people actually came to replicate it is that bomb uh, uh, thing in the trailer and uh, virtually nothing else like that movie is somewhat of a soul-searching experience like this movie is more of a not really a stroll in the park but more than an experience this movie like man I have loads to like about this movie, like the visual effects that still uh, somehow hold up even 10 years when Paris folds itself like a, like a burrito and it, it ex then Paris explodes, then they have practical effects like a whole snow uh, base completely exploded and of course the dream sequences uh, particularly in the hallway of a hotel where the gravity says you know what I'm just going to go out for a drink like it, it like goes shifting inside to sides and to the wall like the human characters like go through wall wall and end up going uh, up in a float like this movie is somewhat of a full-on insanity fever dream I just love this movie so so much like Leonardo DiCaprio and Ellen Page, Joseph Gordon-Levitt, Tom Hardy, Michael Caine completely outdo themselves in some inc in probably one of the best screenplays by Christopher Nolan, the best direction by Christopher Nolan, and possibly one of the best 
Goals by Hans Zimmer. And of course, one of the best cinematographies you can find in a Christopher Nolan movie. It's probably not just one of the best, if not one of the best Christopher Nolan movies ever. And it's also one of the best films of the decade, if so, number one. But what really sold the movie is its amb ambiguous ending, where the tabletop spinner is left spinning and spinning and spinning and spinning. Does he, is he in the real world or is he dreaming? This is Elijah Wells and this is my favourite films of the decade and bye!